think to having commented on a hybrid model, I'm now going to talk about those were hybrids of system science techniques. And I'm now going to proceed to talk about hybrids of of uh, these system science techniques on the one hand, these complexity science techniques with data science on the other, okay? Um, and some people here will know that I taught a whole series of courses in this, on this area um, in the form of boot camps, but also some academic courses here at U of S. And it's not just a matter of hybrid, it's again a matter of, of, of synergy. So the opportunities here reflect where two very, the, the confluence of two very fast evolving, rich, computationally endowed and, and based traditions. On the one side, system science, this understanding and managing behavior of complex systems. And data science on the other hand. Um, we've seen in this semester how you know, so much of system science focuses on understanding underlying complex systems. Empirical data here is considered helpful, but we don't need data on every piece of the system to be required. Um, and there are some models, very, very stylized models, like the Schelling segregation model or uh, the prison of dilemma model. Uh, which are, are so theoretic, they're not even data. They seek some causal understanding of what's going on out there in the world, what we call generative or causal pathway. And we do that to reason about counterfactuals, to reason about situations we've never seen before. What if? Right? Um, and it provides us this way of sort of understanding the systems in part by comparing observations about the world with behavior from our system. And, and, and using that to change our thinking and, and model, our, our working hypothesis of capturing the model. And that provides a way of, 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 of understanding uh, from the state space um, what we might see from the world and, and actually using state space portraits to clue us into what's going on with it. Data science as an enterprise is data driven as it would suggest. It focuses on making use of empirical evidence and, and making use of that to understand the phenomena being studied and often the underlying processes given rise to it, although that's often not discussed as much uh, traditionally. Um, uh, there's uh, often here a focus on uh, on making use not just of one data source, but several, sometimes from the same area. And often it is data that is produced electronically and therefore fine grained in terms of time, high velocity, and, uh, and in terms of sort of spatial, uh, spatial context when we're dealing with collecting data from the world. And theory here is sometimes played down in favor of of representations that are theory driven, where you try to induce the structure from the data. But from a system science standpoint here, we're you know, trying to understand some underlying dynamical system, which we only see bits of. It's like we see little bits of different areas of the world, and we're trying to understand what's going on there, um, about this system. And our observations give rise to data sets about the world that help build confidence about certain types of, 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 of representations of this. But the measurements here are typically delayed. They're not continuous. They're incomplete. They're often noisy. And sometimes they're, um, they're, they're interpreted in ways that really um, that's being driven by things that, that are invariant to the process of the case. So, you know, in today's landscape, there's been this flourishing, particularly in the past 10, 10 or so years, of data science techniques. This is a revolution that we've been part of, but, but uh, 
you know, many other leaders here at U of S and, and elsewhere. Um, and and within it, we have the landscape that that combines uh, data science as a as a general enterprise, including both methodological support for it and things like algorithms, and computer engineering, and visualization tools, and computer systems design at scale, um, with machine learning tools for inference, and as a broader part of artificial intelligence, which is used to, to provide us with, with uh, increasingly capacity of, uh, of artificial systems, to reason at levels that approach human levels of reason, in some cases, see that. Now, within this context, I see system science is overlapping with elements of data science, not being coextensive with them. So there are components of data science uh, or system science that are outside of, of data science. It's not unique to them. But it also overlaps with machine learning. There's components of system science that can be used with and hybridized with machine learning. I want to talk about it here. It's not that these are incompatible, that they're totally distinct things. They're, they're actually um, cutting across it in this way. You can do plenty of system science without data science, but combining with data science and machine learning, there's some very interesting things that can happen. And there's a set of techniques, specific techniques, which we teach uh, in some of the courses, but um, and some of which are, are, are still developing, that really bring together a data science perspective with system science perspective jointly and synergize them in many cases. So stage-based analysis was an area that I had spoken about um, in a previous lecture, where we're, we're trying to estimate and, and often using empirical data, what the state space of the system is that gives rise to it. This is not based on a model. This is based on looking at data from the world, taking advantage of something called Florence embedding. So it's named after Flores Takens, Takens embedding field. Uh, and using that to understand the structure of the system that gives rise to the data. Even one data set of longitudinally intense data, high velocity data, can give you a glimpse of the state space of the system that generates. Because that state, because that in a couple dynamical system, system where there's a lot going on and couple of going on, that one data set whispers to you about all different parts of the system related to it that are driving. So state-based analysis from a single data set can give you this glimpse of the broader system linked up to it. Not very powerful um, from as a data science tool. Parameter estimation and calibration are two related topics. I've asked you to watch the video on calibration, and you'll learn a lot about this, but basically it's tuning the assumptions of a model to allow it to best match observed data from the world. And there's a set of techniques that uh, begin with very, very simple techniques like his Markov models that are done in, that involve us positing a system evolving, in this case, between discrete states, getting observations, and using those observations plus our, our understanding, our theory about what the states are of the model to infer what's going on at any one time. Approximate Bayesian computation is a technique that can be used with these models, system science models, system dynamics models, agent based models, to infer in a sort of approximate Bayesian way the posterior distribution. Distribution for what we believe the values of the parameters are given the data that we have observed. So it's an inference technique for the parameters that. That is inspired by Bayesian, uh, Bayesian uh, mathematics, but it's not strictly Bayesian in character. Markov chain Monte Carlo techniques are techniques for actually rigorously and often undertaken with a Bayesian perspective, sampling from the posterior distribution of parameters. Um, I recognize these terms may not be familiar to you, but basically, you can understand 
what are the possible values of these parameters and what are the distributions of how much they can be drawn? And it turns out that these techniques, which we applied extensively and one of the, the leaders worldwide for applying of what are called particle filtering techniques and sequential Monte Carlo. These are techniques to take a simulation model and run it over time while data comes in. Think data arriving each day for COVID, for example, wastewater observations, data from the health system about new infections and hospitalizations, and turning that into an estimate of the entire state of the system. We don't just tell them the model to be correct, we correct the model's understanding over time using this data. And formally, the model is the stochastic model. There's a variety of possibilities that represent different hypotheses for the underlying situation. And the new data corrects the, to which of these possibilities is most likely. Clues this into there being many, for example, undiagnosed infectives out there, or many people early in the stage of infection who may who may present to hospital in coming weeks. TMC is a technique that, that um, combines the best of both of these that estimates parameters and the underlying state of the model as data comes in. Um, Convergent cross mapping um, technique way here is applied quite a lot, but for basically inferring what causal linkages are there out there in the world that are driving the system. And it's a model free thing. It doesn't require you to assume a certain model. Using data from the world, observational data, we can let it whisper to us what causal linkages are there in that data. That's a big, that's a, a bold statement, but that's exactly what you see on the graph. And finally, I'll note that deep learning approaches and connections to approaches more generally, neural networks, can be combined and increasingly are advanced to try to infer dynamic model structure, try to infer the structure of a system dynamics model, for example, that best accounts for the data observed from the world. Think of a new infection, for example, coming about and being uncertain, for example, how much transmission is occurring because of, you know, by um, by individuals who are asymptomatic. And you might have a model being inferred as data comes in. Um, many of these techniques seek to either estimate the underlying state of the system. What's the situation right now? How many people out there are exposed or infected? How many people out there are undiagnosed infective? How many people out there are asymptomatic? How many people are such early stage of infection we haven't seen them yet? This is estimating the latent state of the system. We have a model and we are estimating the state of that model based on data from the world, together with model structure. The model's evolving, the world's evolving, new data comes in, it changes our interpretation of the underlying situation out there in the world through the lens of the model. It's kind of like looking at data from the world and saying what model state best explains this, this data from the world. And every day new data comes in, updating our understanding, getting an updated best guess for what's going on in the world. These are latent state estimation tools. Coleman filtering is a technique that's been around since the 1960s with Rudolf Coleman. Uh, particle filtering is a newer technique, been around for a couple decades, widely used in robotics. We've used it extensively through the pandemic for providing advice to every province in this country separately and uh, to our to our health system uh, on a daily basis and early in the pandemic. Particle MCMC is a more powerful technique yet, allowing us to estimate values of parameters. And then there's a set of parameter inference techniques. These are different. This is estimating the state of the system. What's the value of each stock as a distribution, typically, for particle filtering and particle MCMC? At a given time, what's, what's the distribution of possibilities? What are most plausible possibilities for the state of the system? Parameter inference 
is estimating what are the values of the parameters of this model. That's a somewhat different question, and they overlap in things like particle MCMC. So we have these techniques that are at once data science techniques, but also system science techniques. And they're quite readily applied in today's environment. So when we look broadly at these techniques, when we look at hybrid system science techniques and hybrid of system science and data science techniques, we are talking about benefits exceeding those of any, any one method. Um, by combining data science and system science, I will note, we get sort of the best of both components. System science is dealing with positive about the causal structure of the system. And increasingly in data science, we see causal machine learning getting attention, sort of inducing things from the world in a way that's sensitive to the positive causal structure and trying to do causal discovery, inferring what causal linkages there are in the world, including with techniques such as CPF, but others as well. That provides data science to go into an area that it hasn't traditionally gone into, which is reasonable counterfactual. What if scenario? Which we've seen in big ways this semester. But meanwhile, by combining these two, you get system science techniques that are really data grounded, that are not based on just some hypothesizing we do by talking with people, understanding the literature, coming up with the best guess as to system structure, but are in some sense where our understanding is being refreshed constantly by observations in the world or our system structure is induced by data in the world. So we have this way of sort of bringing, bringing these two together and system science from one data source can give us this picture of what's going on across the broad system in ways that wouldn't be obvious by traditional data science tools. It tells us not just about that place you've measured, but about many other places in the system, which, is, which raises intriguing possibilities. So a key benefit of, of hybrid techniques uh, in general is to evolve all the boundary with learning. You know, whether it's inferring model structure with deep learning techniques, such as the, the Cindy technique out of the University of Washington, or whether it's changing from a discrete event simulation from system dynamics or changing uh, areas from system dynamics to agent based to get in, to focus in on certain aspects of the model. As we learn, we can change our boundaries. As we learn, we can change how we describe the factors of this system. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really a matter of virtuosity that people like Wade can take multiple techniques, configure them in diverse ways to really, to really address different types of questions. Um, so you want to select your modeling methods here according to the needs um, that you have before you. These are your tools, you are not their tools. And too much modeling has been done with the modeler knowing one technique, one hammer, and going around and, and trying to apply that hammer for all different questions. This is about making the tools, yourself the master of the tools and not both. Uh, so, you know, in this area, um, to really best understand which tools to apply, you want to speak with those who are familiar with many domains of tools and not just one. Okay, so those are some comments on hybrids of system science techniques and on combinations of data science, system science. I'd like to use the last five minutes here to offer some wrap up comments uh, for the course and for those interested in and uh, exploring deeper. So I'm going to stop this recording and